Welcome to another edition of Pause for Thought with me, Greg. I thought it would be important for me to respond to the um, statement that was made by the Archbishop of Canterbury following the Bishop's discussion on living in love and faith. I suppose I have a mixture of I'm happy about the declaration about marriage between a man and a woman and that the church is uh, going to uphold those biblical principles which were founded right from the beginning of the age in Genesis when God created man and woman, that they become one flesh and that they bear children for the good of society and our nation and our world. But then there's a feeling of fudge. I suppose it's like a cheese fondue where rather than everybody getting their own dish, we have a bowl in the middle, we all have a long fork and we can stick our fork into the middle of the cheese and eat from a distance. The Church of England has long been a broad church with lots of different views and traditions. And in some ways, that's been the beauty and the strength of the Church of England. In the statement, it talks about how they've had discussions and contention and difficulties and challenges over six years with this dialogue about LGBTQ plus, whatever the plus means. But I remember many, many years ago, even from when I was a curate and there was the debate going upon over keeping Sunday special and being one of very few who were campaigning to keep Sunday as a day of rest and worship. And I know even as a curate, I was one of few in my diocese that stood for the traditional view, but also I had to pay for my own leaflets and discussions and was poo-pooed by many clergy. And then there was the controversy of, even when I was in theological college with David Jenkins, the Bishop of Durham, who declared that the virgin birth wasn't real, there was no bodily evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. Before that, there was the honest to God debate. And even my own dean from Liverpool Cathedral coming and preaching at our church echoing David Jenkins' view and also enhancing that by saying that also because they discovered some new scrolls uh, that Moses didn't part the Red Sea. Well, God parted the Red Sea, actually. Um, but it wasn't the, the Red Sea, it was the Sea of Reeds. And I was shocked about all these things. We're also amazed that senior leaders of the church would say these, well, I suppose, blasphemous things, denying the word of God. But then on reflection, thinking, wow, it's a bigger miracle that uh, the whole of the Egyptian army were wiped out and drowned in three inches of water. But why I call this a fudge, in one way, it's a, a victory for biblical understanding of marriage. The churches of the South and around the world, and of course, Africa, who call themselves Anglicans, of which there are millions, have made it clear that they stand with the biblical understanding and the historic formulas of the Church of England with regards to sexuality and marriage. 
But the fudge is a slippery slope. We've started with those things I've just discussed. But then the church is full of sinful people. People who don't follow the mandate in scripture to tell the truth, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, in season or out of season, and that we have to pay the price of standing up for that truth, which includes being different from the world and in some cases persecuted by others. I remember the scripture, where did you receive those wounds? In the house of my friends, not necessarily from the world. But for a long time, a long time, the church has ignored significant difficulties and challenges. I remember of a clergy person, I won't say where, who had a relationship with the PCC secretary and the marriage obviously collapsed and they divorced. And the diocese stood with the vicar and the PCC secretary and the wife was on the street. Was that Christian? Is that moral? And they just moved the vicar to another parish. What about the child sex abuse? Where because of deference, oh, a vicar can't possibly do anything like that. And where it came out with the, the bishops that were part of that abuse and that cover up. And the archbishops who had a filing cabinet it's called the Naughty Boy Filing Cabinet, where they would weasel away the evidence and the files and not deal with them and just move the clergy on so that they continued their abuse. What about the blind eye that's been turned to those who live a gay lifestyle? I'm not talking about those who have same-sex attraction and are celibate, because that's quite an important distinction. But I'm talking about those who live a lifestyle that is not biblical. I remember coming to this diocese and there being a ruckus about a man who had come over from the, another diocese to be a senior chaplain in a hospital. And the then standing in bishop wouldn't give him a license because as he moved from that diocese to this diocese, he married his male partner, which was against... Church of England, and biblical teaching. Absolutely right. And I stood with him. And when the, the new bishop of this diocese was appointed, and they had his farewell service, it was shocking how few people came to give him thanks and praise for the amazing work that he had done, not just in that, but in other things, while he was standing in as bishop of this diocese. And what about the many senior appointments? What about the election of a homosexual as a bishop that was stopped? So they made him a dean of a cathedral instead. And more recently, several openly gay in relationship people have been appointed to senior positions within cathedrals. 
many saying that they're celibate, which is important, necessary. But are we just turning a blind eye and taking people at the word? We're fallen human beings. We have lustful needs. And turning a blind eye is accepting something which is not biblical. So the church has a track record of fudge. And what they do is they give you a piece of fudge. It looks nice. It tastes lovely. But actually, in the end, all you do is get toothache. And if you have too much, you get diabetes. And it's a slippery slope. Scripture does say that we should dwell together in peace. But there are red lines. It'd be interesting to see in the coming months what these prayers are going to be to allow uh, wedding blessings. It will also be very interesting to see the provision they're going to make for those who, out of all conscience and biblical understanding, can't do it and won't. You may say that we've got a two-tier church. Well, I think we've got more than a two-tier church. We've had it since the introduction of women priests, where some who were unable to come under the authority of a woman or a woman bishop had separate provision made for them for oversight. What we've got now is a halfway house. But of course, these things are all predicted in Scripture. The great falling away the teaching of things which are not biblical. Just look at the book of Revelation of the things together, not least about what's going on in the weather, in pestilence, pandemic, immorality, chaos, anarchy, the turning away from Christian values, even of our own nation, below 50% for the first time ever. I'm not actually quite sure whether people who said that they were Christian were actually Christian. They probably would say that they're Church of England. And that's not necessarily being born again, spirit-filled, and a Christ-centred, believing Christian, whose life demonstrates fruit in line of repentance and the fruit of the Spirit. So as we move ahead into this 2023, I believe God is calling us to stand up for what is right. He's also calling us to be more repentant, Review our faith and our life choices. Be loving. You know, I am not condemning any gay or homosexual person. God loves them as much as he loves me and you. He died for them as much as he died for me and for you. But if I sin, and the way in which we measure sin is by, does my life measure up to what it says in Holy Scripture? As much as anybody else, as much as heterosexuals do, who have sexual relationships outside of marriage. There are consequences. And we must repent. We must turn from our wicked ways. Turn to the Lord. 
Sin is sin. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We may not like it, but it's necessary and it's right and it's God's word. Who are we to seek to change what God has said? We are nothing. You know, the more we look at the universe, we find that we're even smaller than small. And that God takes any notice, as it says in scripture, is mind-blowing. And it's also not for us to call people and judge people. When we preach the truth, people will choose one way or the other. They're right. That's what God-given right. And then it's up to God to do something in people's hearts, as much as in mine as in yours. It's not for me to declare one way of living against another. My task is to just lay out what God has said in Scripture. I was talking to some young people in the local school about uh, British values. And we're saying about how in Qatar, being a Muslim country, they had declared that there was a ban on all alcohol in the stadiums, and there was an outroar, and also that you were not allowed to have sexual relations with anyone who wasn't your wife. Now, if you go to somebody else's country, you follow their moral code and their way of life, or don't go. It's interesting when they come to this country, that's just a free for all. But what was the outcome? Yes, there was outrage. Yes, there was upset. Yes, there was demonstrations. Yes, there was trying to change that culture by imposing a different culture on them. And because the ruling... Uh, leaders of that country were strong in their faith they didn't wash but what was the outcome a quiet peaceful respectful enjoyable world cup family centric no drunken ball brawls no riots no fighting not ve very few arrests. As we heard the other day about uh, what happened in one football match, no thumping a goalkeeper in the back. Having a moral compass and ours being the Ten Commandments is absolutely crucial. I used to joke many years ago, I repent, Lord. <laughs> but the Church of England was like Woolworths. Pick and mix. But unfortunately, when we pick and mix, we realise that we've strayed away from the narrow way. And we're on the wide road that leads to destruction. So we need to stand firm in prayer, in humility, in repentance, and teach the truth as revealed in Holy Scripture. And as we're seeing more and more evidence, archaeological and uh, scriptural and through scrolls and things that are being found virtually day by day, is validating the truth of God's word. Who is on the Lord's side? Choose life. As for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. What about you? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've called us to be people of peace and of love, but you also have called us to be people of truth. And we thank you for the example over the centuries of those who, standing for the truth, 
in opposition to the ways of the world because we're in the world but not of the world sometimes have to pay and even today pay the ultimate sacrifice help us to stand for that truth in love and in hand in hand with you that we may bring glory to you and set your people free that when you return in glory holiness majesty and power we will be ready as a bride beautifully adorned to receive her husband We pray for those who will not like our message. We pray for those who will persecute and hate us. And we pray that you bless them and open their eyes and ears and hearts to the truth, which sets us all free. That the earth may be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Amen. So until next time, it's a big God bless you from me, Greg. Bye.